Uh, I'm Doug Kelly. If you don't know me, consider yourself fortunate. <laughs> no, I've, uh, I've, I've authored three books. Uh, this was my first one, Florida's Fishing Legends and Pioneers, in 2011, published by the University Press of Florida. And in 2016, I did a book in Alaska. That's like my second home. Um, Alaska's Fishing Legends and Pioneers. Then a few years ago, I did another one on Dirty Trickster Corporate Spy. It's about corporate spying in the corporate world. And I'm working on a fourth one now. Always doing that. People ask me how your book's selling. I always tell them like cold cakes. <laughs> but it's fun. It's enjoyable. It's a nice release. My wife and I also do a radio show here in town for four years. Four years now called uh, The Kelly Kelly Show. And we talk about different things and issues and whatnot that are happening around town. And we have different political and business leaders and it's, it's enjoyable. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about Florida's fishing legends and pioneers. And how many people here fish? I know, all right, okay, all right. There's fishing all over the world, right? But if you really boil down to it and look at a map, uh, the United States is probably the premier place to fish, considering our coastlines and our lakes and rivers and the Gulf. And if you took that, that stake, so to speak, of the world in fishing, Florida would be the filet mignon. It's, it is probably holds more world records in the books than any other location of the same area inside by far. So um, a lot of people had came to Florida in the, after the Indians in the 1800s, and obviously in the 20th century and now presently, uh, and our state grew up to 22 million people. But there's a lot of colorful people who really helped make sport fishing popular in our state. I'm gonna go over just a few of them. Alrighty, let's see if I get this right. I do. Jesse Lindsay. Jesse Lindsay was born in 1872, and he lived in Georgia. And what's mainly re uh, remarkable about him is two things. Obviously, he's a black person. And secondly, he was six feet, six inches tall. He stood out. But he was nice and kind to everybody. They called him the, the, the gentle giant of Ponce Inlet. Ponce Inlet, Inlet is up near Jacksonville area. He was so big that he had to cut out the sides, of his, sides and the toes of his shoes. He didn't have shoes that would fit him. But what's amazing is back in the early 1900s, he worked for a hotel called the Pacetti Hotel. And he liked to fish. And he was good at it. And back then they didn't have motors. You had to have a boat with oars, right? He was the only person strong enough when the tide was coming in to take a boat out mm -hmm. the inlet. Well, people started saying, hey, can, you, can I go fishing with you? Well, pretty soon he became a fishing guy. And that's the, it doesn't sound like a big deal now, but then it was pretty remarkable for white people to put their day, day safety into the hands of a black man. So it just told you how good he was. He was a legend up there. And here he is with a couple of sheep's head. If you know what those are. Yeah. Those are delicious fish. And that's uh, the river, the St. Lawrence River, and that's where, not St. Lawrence, uh, St. Augustine River, I think. And that's the hotel where he worked out of, right there. And the inlet was up this way. The next guy is Charlie Thompson. He was my dad's brother's wife's dad, okay? So he was my uncle's wife's father. And this is back in the 1920s. And he was quite the showman, Charlie Thompson. He, uh, besides being an accomplished charter captain, he was a tremendous promoter. He was like B.T. Uh, uh, P. T. Barnum of, of that era. And one time he was down in the Keys, off the Middle Keys, and he spotted something huge floating in the water. He went up to it, it was a whale shark. And he got an idea, this thing was dying. 
you know, I came, came in, sort of floated in. So he hooked it up to his boat, brought it up to Miami, got it onto a rail, rail car. There it is there. There's the fish there on the, right there. There's the, the rail. And he took it all over the east coast of the United States after he dried it out and put formaldehyde in it and tried to clean it up so it would spoil the stink, you know. He put a tent over it and he called it a sea monster. <laughs> and she charged five cents to go in to see it and ten cents if you want a picture with it. And he made a lot of money to it. I bet he did. Uh, I bet he did. <laughs> it was finally destroyed when he kept it in his yard and it, even with all the formaldehyde and whatever, it was rotting so bad, it stunk so bad, his wife said it's me or that, one of the two. So he got rid of the thing. But he guided a lot of people, back, a lot of famous people came to South Florida even back in the early 1900s. Uh, he guided President Harding, John Jacob Astor, Frederick Vanderbilt, and actually went on a world tour of Vanderbilts uh, and different, goes all across the world. So he was quite the character. Next, oh, there it is again. No, wait, let me go back to it. A better shot of it. Whoa. So what he did when he got it in before, you notice how thin it was? What he did is he got it and put, got inside of it and put struts in it to make it look. To hold it up. Hold it up and to make it look even like a real bigger, big thing. That's what people would go to that stand right next to this rail car and uh, get their picture taken. <laughs> Famous Florida sideshow. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, Ted Smallwood is really important in the scheme of things because between Tampa and Key West, there really was nothing to stop. You really couldn't stop and have any supplies. There were just no stores. There was no marina if you had repairs and broke down. Well, Ted Smallwood moved to this little town called Chukaluski. And if you know where Everglades City is, it's over on the southwest part of Florida, underneath Fort Myers. You go about, oh, 30, 40 miles up south of Fort Myers. So, he became really popular as an outpost, and he befriended the Indians in the area. He was real smart. That's obviously Ted there. And that's, I think, uh, Tiger, Chief Tiger. And people would come inside of his store and just lounge around and talk to locals because there weren't a lot of locals. And he had this amazing ability, which was remarkable, that people would order things. They wouldn't come in and order, oh, I want some this and that. They'd come in and order a lot because they just came from Tampa. They're out of everything. And they would sit there and get, rattle off all of these different items that, he, that they needed. He would remember. He wrote nothing down. He had, a, he had a photographic memory. And he would calmly after they were finished, he'd go and collect all the items they wanted and never missed. He was famous for that. And of course, his fishing was phenomenal back then. This is a tarpon. And uh, that's back when they just started having outboard motors, as you can see, how primitive that looks compared to today. They were only like six, seven, eight horsepower. So you wouldn't go water skiing on them. But they'd get you out and around and back. Well, we all know who this is. Ernest Hemingway. He lived in the key, in the uh, in Key West from like 1923 to 1933. He built a house down there, a two-story house on the west side of the of the uh, island, and it's now a museum. You may have gone to Key West. You may have seen seen it. And he was a heavy drinker. Everything that they talk about. Hemingway, he was a bra brawler, he was a womanizer, he was a fisherman, he loved to fish. And of course, being a famous author, pictures of him would be taken when he would be in the Bahamas or in Cuba or in the Gulf Stream off of Key West with these big fish. Well, this would get picked up by the international press. And so he did a lot for sport fishing to popularize it because of the fact of his fame and celebrity, and he loved to fish. And he had a wooden boat called the Pilar, P-I-L-A-R. And a replica of that boat 
is in Isla Morada. If you ever go to the Florida Keys, there's a uh, huge retail store, three-story thing called um, uh, Bass Pro Shops, but it's called Worldwide Sportsman. And if you go in there, they have a replica of his boat, Pilar. But he, again, he was a good fisherman. There he is again, posing, obviously, on the left. That's his famous Cuban fishing guide, who was with him for years. And he'd go to the Baha I mean, go to, to Havana and fish. <clears throat> and there's a swordfish right there that they caught. So he, he was a big, big uh, offshore fisherman. Let me go back again. And uh, not many people know this, but during World War II, because he was out in the water so much, oops, because he was out in the water so much, he was working with the U.S. Navy. <clears throat> and if he spotted a submarine, when he got back in, he would report it, that there was a submarine out there. So he was a spy. Not many people realized it. <clears throat> that is Bill Fagan. We're still back in the early 1900s here, somebody being born. Bill was actually born uh, up in Melbourne, Florida, and he ran away from home when he was a kid, went to New Orleans. And New Orleans back in 1918, 1916, 1920, really wasn't a good place for a kid. There were a lot of red light districts, a lot of, well, the Italian Mafia was actually forming there at that time. A lot of uh, tough things going on, but he learned to fish out of private boats. He was a hand on a private boat. When he earned enough money, he came back and he bought his own boat, and um, he named it the Florida Cracker. And it was a 38-foot boat, and he's the first person who really decked out a boat specifically to go sport fishing. Everybody else had just got a boat that was used for something else <clears throat> and fished off of it. But he, he fixed it and he got it all trimmed out to actually fish. And there it is there. It didn't look like much, but that, that was the pride of the Miami fleet was that boat right there. Of course, now they're all modernistic, cost hundreds of thousands, and they're all tricked out for, for fishing. But uh, he would go up in, in summers when it was slowed down in here, he would go up to New York and, and uh, talk up people and go to clubs where a lot of wealthy people are. And he'd bring them, you know, tell them to come back down and fish. He was a good promoter. And he held world records on uh, marlin and tuna off, the, off Miami and the Bahamas. And uh, he's had quite a guy. Here's, a, here's an interesting picture. That's him up there on top. He wasn't a big guy, but he was strong and scrappy. <clears throat> Look at that catch. Wow. Uh huh. We all know it got a hold of the end of that, right? Sure. But that's Bill Fagan. He looks more like an accountant, doesn't he, uh -huh. than a charter boat captain. Okay, our next person is Jimmy Albright. And he was in the U.S. Navy, and the U.S. Navy only had about six or seven different basic knots. And Jimmy started experimenting and whatever and came up with about a dozen more. Uh -huh. They were more effective than the ones the U.S. Navy was, were using. And actually one of his knots is called the Albright knot <clears throat> that is tied in fishing where you tie a heavier line to a smaller line. And that you can do that without using a swivel. And he became a guy in the 1950s <coughs> and 1960s in the Keys and he, uh, he would have uh, Really tremendous trips. These are tarpon. This is back when, <clears throat> when tarpon were commonly brought to shore and held up and they were killed. Kind of like a trophy picture, you know, like somebody with safari with a lion. We don't do that anymore. We release all these big fish. But um, that's Jimmy Albright right here uh, with several people. Um, Cecil Keith is another famous guy and two customers there. And uh, <clears throat> here he is with a, with a sailfish with this fellow who was Joe Brooks. Joe Brooks became a very famous uh, writer in the field of uh, saltwater fishing. He lived in Maryland, became a mentor of a fellow named Lefty Cray, who himself became famous 
in fly fishing circles. And uh, <clears throat> that's Jimmy there in his later days. That's misspelled. It's actually spelled Jimmy, J-I-M-M-I-E. So they misspelled his name here. And that's a friend of ours named Al Fluger. And Al Fluger, <clears throat> uh, I'll go on and talk about him in a minute, but in my opinion, was the best angler who ever lived. When you take everything into uh, account. And uh, Jimmy um, became famous guiding people like Ted Williams, the actor Jimmy Stewart. He helped set world records on tarpon and bonefish. And I moved to the Keys back in 1987. I bought a boat, but I didn't know anything about the back country. Florida Bay is fairly shallow areas and lots of little creeks you have to know how to get through and you get stuck. And I was starting to write for the local paper down there <clears throat> called the Free Press. And I got a hold of Jimmy. He was guiding out of, out of that area. And I said, could I do an article about you? He says, better yet, I'll go fishing with you. I said, oh my gosh, that's great. He says, do you have a boat? I said, I said yeah. He said, well, use your boat. And we made arrangements to meet at a, at a uh, marina. We went out fishing, and he guided me where to go. And <clears throat> we get to this one cove way out in northeast Florida Bay, and he said, all right, now, get out of the boat. Take that big shrimp you have on the end of your line, wade as close as you can to the opening of that cove and throw that shrimp in there, watch what happens. Welcome to Florida Bay, Doug. And so he's laughing so hard. Even then, at that time, he was like 75 years old. He was, he was turning blue, I thought he might die. But just as I'm in, out of the boat, the, the current cleared the water and there was a blue crab like this, coming right toward my favorite organ. And I grabbed the side of the boat and catapulted into the bolt, left my shoes in the muck. They're still out there. <laughs> Anyways, that was my initiation to Florida Bay from, uh, from that guy right there. Oh. There he is in his dotage, more or less. Still around, though. He, he has passed away. He died uh, years back. This is a local fellow. He's from Largo. And he made plastic lures when he lived in Illinois. And he moved to Largo and continued making lures and, and even golf clubs. And I don't know if you've fished much, but he invented mirror lures. And it's still today a very, very uh, popular lure that's sold all over the world. And uh, what's remarkable about him, there he is, standing, you can see his old car there with the fish. Looks like a bass. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a bass he caught out of Lake Tarpon up in the north part of the Pinellas there, Tarpon Spring. Here he is with uh, some sea trout. But uh, he, uh, did something that became famous. On June 6th, 1962, at 7 a.m., he battled a tarpon from midnight, uh, no, from 7 a.m. in the morning until midnight that night. Massive fish. We took him all the way up to Homosassa, Cedar Key, all the way back down to Tampa, and then he lost it right off of uh, <coughs> uh, Dunedin. But... Uh, <coughs> It was a, and back then they did have radios, and everybody was talking about it, and they drew crowds where it was going, people stopping fishermen to watch this battle. And of course he didn't, he slept for like three straight days after that. I mean, he was so exhausted. It was pretty cool though. Stu Apt, Stu Apt, 1930 to present. Actually, he's 92. Still around, lives in the Florida Keys with his wife Janine. And he taught me how to fly fish. But he was a Navy fighter pilot. And then he would work for Pan Am. And wherever he would go on his flights, he would put in the, in the uh, cabin of the plane fishing rods, fly rods. So he was visiting places nobody had even fly fished before. And if they did, they didn't know really how to catch them. He was setting world records in Australia 
in South Africa and Europe, and uh, it was amazing. He, he, it was really cool. There he is in the water. That fish pulled him out of the water, that tarpon, and he was so tenacious, he would go in the water with it and still, ca and still catch it. Uh, he's real scrappy. He's, he's, he used to be a, a fighter when he was in the Navy, he actually boxed and whatever, so he's tough as nails. But there he is with Ted Williams. That's Ted Williams here. And he fished Ted Williams a lot in Florida Bay and for bonefish. Ted Williams, of course, is the great baseball player, the world famous baseball player. Side stories of these fishing people are, they're humans, you know, the humanizing of them. Uh, that's Stu there with a, one of his world record fish. And uh, that was his guide. There he is again in the water. He, you know, he was when you when you put a gaff in the mouth of the tarpon, that thing, that fish weighs 150 pounds. It doesn't want to come in the boat, and it's going to pull and push and thrash, and it'll pull you out of the boat. Most people just let it go. Uh, again, this is youth. This is old. People don't do this anymore. And there's Stu again with a guy named Ralph Delph, a famous guy from the Keys. You can see what kind of fish they were catching on fly rods. Uh, many consider him the greatest tarpon fisherman on fly who ever lived. Speaking of Ted Williams, he played for the Boston Red Sox for many years. Still the only person I think to have had a, an average batting average at the end of the year of over 400. And What's interesting is he had a house in the Keys, and he loved to fish. He's 6'3", was, 6'3", so he could stand on the bow of a boat, and he had great vision, and his vision was so acute, he had 20-10 vision. 2020 is average, you know, pretty good. 2015 is phenomenal. 2010 is almost like Superman. He could spot the tiniest movement in the water at a great distance, and that was a huge advantage if you're fishing for... Uh, fish in, in shallow water like you are for bonefish, as, as he did. When I was just a boy, my dad, we lived at Homestead Air Force Base, we heard Ted Williams was going to be there giving a presentation in the sporting goods department because he was at that point working for, I think, uh, J.C. Higgins, or one of the sporting goods companies from way back there. And uh, he would stand 30 feet away from a basket basket had a mouth about that big. He'd get about from me to you. And he had a rod with a plug on it. He took the, the hooks, the treble hooks off. And he threw that plug into the basket 10 straight times. So then he moved back. And now he's about 50 feet from that bang, that, that same basket, right? He throws that thing ten times and puts all ten of them in the basket. Then he moved back to 75 feet. I know it's incredible. He put nine of them in the basket. The tenth one hit the rim and fell out. He told everybody, the wind got it. Of course, it was inside of a, of a place. But can you imagine that accuracy? Practice, practice, practice. And he said that's the same thing that applied to why he became one of the greatest sluggers in baseball in history. He would practice until he was so tired he would collapse and he'd practice another hour on top of it. That's how he punished himself. He said, but if you're going to be better than the best, there's only one way. And, and Muhammad Ali, the boxer, said the same thing. He said he hated every day of training. But he knew he had to sacrifice if he was going to be a champion. It'd be worth it. And that was his mentality. He was, a, he was an amazing person. I never fished with him, but I talked to him on the phone once. And uh, we were going to talk for an interview when I was editor at Sport Fishing Magazine. <clears throat> we were going to uh, just have a 10 minute conversation and turn into 40 minutes. Just talk about fishing. Do something else. Okay. Al Fluger, okay. Uh, 
Al's heritage was taxidermy. His dad started the taxidermy business back in the 1920s. And uh, he studied fish because he had to paint them. So he would get a mask on and a snorkel and go down on the reef and look at the fish and see how they look in their natural habitat. And this way the fish that they were uh, that they were doing taxidermy on were lifelike and looked look, look like they should be. Uh, he uh, was a consistent tournament winner. Whenever he showed up for a fishing tournament, chances are Al Fluger was going to come out on top. And uh, <coughs> here he is with his mom and his grandmother hmm. way, way back in Miami Beach on a trip. And there's Al here with a fish he caught on fly. It's, it's a spear fish, very rare. And uh, there he is with, a, with four snook that he caught in Florida Bay. Hmm. Uh, really just a phenomenal angler. And a nice guy. He's still a friend of ours. He's up there in age and having some health issues, but he's uh, he's something else. <laughs> Roland Martin looks like a movie star and a TV star more than anything else, and that's what he became—a TV star, bass fishing. <clears throat> he was the very first to really maximize television in the world of fishing, and he would go to these bass tournaments and win. And he had a marina of his own up at Lake Okeechobee and uh, has a tremendous personality. He has a house also now in Naples. And he invited me to his home one time. I was doing a, well, this book. And uh, he wouldn't let me leave. I mean, I'm a complete stranger and he treated me like I was an old friend. And he was making turkey calls. Very, very personable guy. Very nice guy. And uh, he bought a home in Isla Morada in the Keys because he go th went there a lot and he fished this tournament called the Red Bone. And he bought this house, put it closed on it the day before the tournament. He hadn't even furnished it yet, but he had put a cot in it and a bed so he could sleep in it <clears throat> instead of going to a hotel. And the night before the tournament, it was pretty windy, but he had left something out on the front porch of his front porch that he was bringing into the house. So he went in, got it, the wind slammed the door shut and locked it. Oh. And here he is in this ritzy neighborhood and standing there in his underwear, <laughs> <laughs> knocking on doors, asking if anyone could help him. And people are slamming the door. <laughs> so that's kind of the funny thing that happened to him. But he's, he's a super cool guy. He really is. And he was very, very sharing with his time. Here he is, I think, in... Um, one of the wars we've been in that he was help working with the troops. And last but not least is Marsha Bierman. And what was great about Marsha, besides the fact that she was a very attractive girl, she used to be a Miami Dolphins cheerleader, uh, is that she married this guy who loved to fish. She started learning to fish. And she developed a technique to catch large fish, thousand pound fish, marlin, on stand-up gear one. And she developed this short rod technique and had the strength to do it. But what it helped prove is you don't have to be some big, hairy male wrestler to be an angler. If, if a woman knows the right techniques, then she can be as good as any other male angler. And it, it was proven many times. If you ask any fishing guide today, if they take a man out or a woman out, who's the best person who can fish on the boat? The woman. You know why? She'll listen to what the guy says for to her. The guy thinks he knows it all. I've heard that over and over and over again. But she really led the way. She was phenomenal. There she is in the Bahamas. She and her husband, Lenny, fished in the Bahamas quite a bit off their boat. That's her 100th marlin wow. release. She cut, and these are fish that weigh seven, eight, six, seven, eight times her weight that she would bring to the boat. Released every fish. She never, ever brought in a fish, even if it was a world record size fish, she would never do it. And that mentality was kind of a trailblazer. Catch and release, catch and release. There she is, pigtails. And uh, before I get 
leave Marsha Beerman, she had such a big heart. She and Lenny would go to visit different places that some of the native villagers and whatever didn't have much. And they always had animals look like they were starving. She would actually pack cans of dog food in her luggage when she would go to different places and feed the dogs and cats in, in the area. Mm -hmm. So she was quite something. This is the famous Pier 5 that was in Miami for many, many years on Bayfront Park. It's no longer there. Now it's a shopping mall. But that's uh, pretty much, uh, that's, that's what this is, this book's all about. And of course there's a whole bunch of more other people in it. Every chapter's got illustrations in it. And uh, I thank you. Okay.